This is Startup Storefront. And on today's episode, we're unpacking the science of how to get unstuck. It's no coincidence that that's also the title of the book written by our guest today, author, psychotherapist, and trauma specialist, Britt Frank. Britt knows a thing or two about getting unstuck, as she has battled with everything from meth addiction to sexual abuse. She emerged from that trauma with a new outlook on life, a master of social work degree, and a desire to help others overcome their own hurdles. These hurdles vary from individual to individual, but when it comes to entrepreneurship, it's not uncommon for someone to put up a mental blockade that prevents them from moving forward. Getting over this mental blockade that inhibits you from progressing forward is what we are dissecting today. In today's episode, we discuss why you don't need every friend to be a best friend, how COVID didn't create a mental health crisis, it just exposed the one we already had, and the power behind changing your whys to what. So roll up your sleeves and let's start the process of getting unstuck. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Britt Frank, author of The Science of Stuck. Thanks for coming on. Hi, thanks for having me. I want to talk to you for a number of reasons. One, my buddy to my right is stuck. <laughs> Hi. Two, <Hello. laughs> I, I, think, I think every entrepreneur, the reason I like entrepreneurship and I think our listeners enjoy it is, is because really to me, it's like a personal journey of you discovering yourself. And, and that means you dealing with all of you. And I think when you create a product and you try to bring it to market, that's really a reflection of just how big you're thinking or how small you're thinking. And it's totally okay. And I think in every entrepreneurship company, product, whatever it is, there's a journey. And it's certainly usually evolving and usually directionally forward and up, sometimes linear, sometimes exponential. But in that, you have to do a lot of like mental gymnastics, which is something you are an expert in. More like mental contortionism. Okay. I don't think people realize that entrepreneurship is going to hold up a giant mirror to every single thing about your personality that you can't hide as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to face it all. The mm -hmm. good, the bad, and the what the actual fuck about yourself. Yes. Which is great. Yes. And until tricky. It until it happens to you. <laughs> yeah. What made you want to write the book? So I wrote the book because I wish someone had written like a brain owner's manual, just like here are the bottom lines, because a lot of the books are really fluffy and they're really academic or they're just really simple. I just wanted someone to say, here are like the 10 things you need to know to get moving. Because we don't need to get from stuck to awesome. We just need to get from stuck to go. And then from go to a little bit further. But we all want to go because social media. From stuck to here I am. And there's a lot of stops on the way. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about your story. And Yay. so obviously you're writing a book to some way solve your problem. <laughs> and to share it with the world as we do. That's yes. our product. Let's talk about your story. So I have my shiny story, the, and I'm a trauma specialist, and I'm a licensed psychotherapist, and I wrote the book. And then my sordid story is, you know, childhood trauma, and out of that trauma, terrible life decisions, drug addiction, sex and relational addiction, and just a huge hot mess of a, you know, of a situation. Yeah. And then I got better. Well, I joined a religious cult for a while first, and then I got better. And then in the getting better, I sort of accumulated all of these pieces of information about the brain. And it was like, God damn it, why didn't anyone tell me this? It's sort of like driver's ed. If you don't know how to drive a car, driving is not going to make sense. We have these brains that we walk around with all day. And like, did anyone ever teach you, hey, here's how your brain's gas pedal works. Here's where the emergency brake is. So if you don't know that, you're gonna drive into walls and then think you're crazy. When you joined the cult, was there anything in the cult that was helpful that you learned? So I know it's a weird question, yeah. but, but I think in some ways, usually cults stem from same thing. There's a problem they're trying to solve. It. They have a hot take or a different take, but sometimes they're, you know, could maybe. It can get destructive. <laughs> <laughs> As some things do. So oddly enough, cult life was a really nice resting place. It's not sustainable. And to be clear, not all cults are like Westboro Baptists that are hate groups. Not all cults are sex cults. Not all cults are murder cults. However. Well, the name carries a stigma with it. I mean, cults are not good. No cult right. is good, but there's a spectrum from like generally dysfunctional sure. okay. to yeah. people are now dying. So mine skewed more towards, you know, the not people are dying side. Okay. But cult life is incredibly appealing because I didn't want to be a human. I didn't know how to be a person. So someone said, if you read this, wear this, eat this, think this, say this, you're good and we will love you and we will feed you and we will give you mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and any problem that you have is just something that you can pray away just pray it away you're anxious pray it away you know you have trauma pray it away sign me up anything to avoid what was actually happening in my mind at what the was time. the moment for you where you realized you had to start doing the work and looking inward like what was the <laughs> thing where you're like okay some people talk about hitting a rock bottom right i don't think you have to necessarily do that I think it sounds a little much, but some people do. 
I don't like the framework of rock bottom because it's mm-hmm. like you can get to the bottom and keep digging. As right. long as you're alive, <laughs> yeah, like rock bottom target. is death. So right, I don't like right. rock bottom. Rock bottom is wherever you say, okay, I'm done. I'm ready to do something different. For me, that was meth. Meth drove me to the end pretty quickly. It was like, okay, you're going to die if you don't figure this out. So figure wow. it out. So I did. Did you get close? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you mix meth addiction and sex addiction and love addiction all together. That is a recipe for some serious, what the hell, Dateline NBC kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, then, so then what did you do? So you recognize, okay, something's got to give. So then I started admitting to myself truths about myself that I didn't want to deal with. You know, everything from, wow, I have like this monstrous closet full of dark shadows to, hey, I don't like being sad. And in my effort to not be sad, I do X, Y, and Z. You know, humaning really is, can you tolerate your body sensations? Entrepreneurship is, can you tolerate all of the stuff that's going on in not just your mind, but in your body? Because this mental health thing is not about your mind. It's about your body. Like your brain's going to go to weird places if you don't know that you have a body and it does things. Explain that. Give an example of that, of something that yeah. maybe from the book. There's so, countless examples in the and book. And I re- make this really reductive. It's you know more complex. So if neuroscientists are listening to this, don't get mad. This is not literal. <laughs> Save your angry emails. Exactly. Don't DM me. So you know there's a part of your brain that's responsible for logic. So if you're trying to make a good decision, you need that part of your brain accessible. But the problem is, if you are in a state of fight or flight, if your brain, for whatever reason, feels unsafe or feels overwhelmed, the logic part of your brain goes offline. And the emotional, irrational part of me knows I should do this, and yet there's this other part of me that does that, takes over. And we need to know how to work with those parts. So I did, and I learned it, and then I got trained in it. How did you learn it? Just from like trial and error, or just like almost having conversations with yourself? That's something I've developed. It's like, I'll just talk to myself. Like I, I think personally I dealt with imposter syndrome when I started a real estate development company because I was like, who is this kid doing real estate development when I didn't know anything about anything? And I was, I was probably depressed for like three weeks and I'd wake up depressed. Like I'd wake up super sad. And I, and I was someone who didn't really acknowledge these. I, I, I'm a person that if you believe it and if you say you're depressed, you've now given it a life. And so I was very much always like, I'm not using the words. I'll just be... I'm in a funk, I'm, you know, I'll go to the gym. Like I'll try to get myself out of this cloud. And so what would happen is every time I went to bed, this, this thing came back up like this, this guy, this, this dark room. And after probably two and a half weeks of this, I, and, and it was in my dream. And so I, I just decided to talk to it in my, so I'm dreaming. So I'm dreaming the conversation. And so it's this dark room and I'm like, why is it that you're here? Like, why, what is this? And I just started talking to it which was really strange, but I realized like I had to do that to get, it was like a video game. Like I just have to keep going back to the, to the boss to defeat the boss. And, and after probably three or four nights of talking to it, I was like, I see what this is. If I stay in this space, the world doesn't get better. I'm basically being selfish. And I was like, you're a part of my ego that wants me to do nothing. And I'm good with you now. And that was it. And I woke up the next day and I was like, fine. It's like I had made peace, but it's not like I, I didn't acknowledge it didn't exist. We, I just recognized this is real. It's not going away. And now I have like a name for it. And, and we call it a buddy now. But you did something really profound in that that took me a lot of years and fighting was you extended curiosity. Yeah. And most of us are schooled at beating the shit out of ourselves. And oh my God, I'm crazy. I'm lazy. I'm unmotivated. I'm depressed. What's wrong with me? And you sat there and said, hey, bud, what's up? And extending curiosity to all of these parts of ourselves is something we're not taught how to do. I don't know where you picked that particular skill up, but like it's the entire therapeutic model I'm trained in. So well done. I I couldn't figure it. I don't know about you. How'd you figure it out? Did you figure it out? What's Nick your story? Still stuck. What's your story, stuck. Nick? How do we get Nick unstuck? I mean, my Tell her st- why you're stuck. <laughs> yeah, what's going on? Well, if we can identify the problem, it's paralysis analysis. <laughs> it's just I, I overanalyze things. And I, because I, at my core, I want to break things down and understand the ins and outs of everything before I do something so that I can be the best at it. But in order to be the best, I, I feel like I need to know every little thing about it. And that often leads to hesitation and, and inaction because I'm just, I want to make sure every step is, is thought of along the way. I want to think things through. And, uh, you know, in, in doing this podcast, I learned that you, you really, like I, we've talked to so many people who you can't so know many people. Ev- <laughs> so many people. <laughs> You can't possibly know every single outcome, every single 
path or or fork that the the road is going to take and i i would like to think that i'm getting better at it uh, i'm making steps towards just uh moving in a direction and then figuring things out but there is still a big part of me that sees sees this path and wants to know exactly where it goes before i set out on because it because what will happen if you don't Welcome to therapy yeah, with Brit. <laughs> right. Let's go. Let's solve this. What will happen if I don't? Mm-hmm. I, I think I'm, I'm worried about failure. The failure of not achieving a goal, of, of being less than uh, living up to my potential in that goal. And so it's, it's strange. Like when, so my background uh, growing up, I, got, I was always an athlete and I, I view the world in sort of that lens. But that lens is like very much, um, you know, do, do like trust the process and just take all the steps along the way and you'll meet your goals. And for some reason I don't like, I have no problem just starting out, like building into something when it comes to like, uh, an athletic goal. But when it comes to anything else, I have yet to like flip that switch and, and just start out when it comes to anything else, I don't know that I have the confidence in myself to, to just trust that I'll find it along the way. I, I think that comes from a confidence issue of just not believing that I will find it along the way. If I, if I don't know it ahead of time, how cute is this? He's like the cutest. It's so, adorable. You're not my client, so I'm not going to go all the way down the rabbit hole that I want to go down. I will say this, though. What you're describing is very much a body sensation that we call freeze. So, like, in your nervous system, you go analysis paralysis is a state of shutdown. So we think it's a confidence issue. We think it's an imposter issue. But it's like you're, neurologically, your brain is seeing a lion staring at you. The lion is called failure. And as long as your brain perceives failure as an existential threat, you're going to stay stuck. We need to re you know, reconfigure what failure actually means. Because if failure becomes a necessary component of any kind of success, your body won't react to it like it's a tiger about to kill you. Mm-hmm. Which, how do you do that? How do you, how do you get, how do you get yeah. people to understand like failures? Like that's what we were saying before, right? It's like mm-hmm. sometimes on the road to entrepreneurship or just personal journey, always you have to fuck up. Like there's gotta be a part where it's, ugh, yeah. oh, what did I just do? Yeah, well, I would say to Nick, where do you feel this ick feeling in your body right now? Because as we're talking, do you notice that you're clenching? I, I love yeah, it. And love like, it. you're getting all squirrely. Look at his yeah. hands. Look at the poor Clammy. guy's hands. God. Right? <laughs> so, sweating. <laughs> somatic work would actually have you get to really notice, like kind of like you extended curiosity to that part of your ego, yeah. extending curiosity to your nervous system. Hey, bo- hey, you have a body, you know? Really thoughtful, analytical people generally live like neck up. Yeah. It's like welcome, especially athletes it's because you have to train yourself out of noticing discomfort and pain. So welcome to your body. You have one and it's doing things that are important. And so we would have to sort of de-fear the whole failure thing. And there's lots of ways to do that. One of which would be go out and fuck up three times today. On purpose. On purpose. And see that you don't die. Yeah. How do you, how do you tell people to do that? So, so I think about it like this, like maybe he goes to the coffee shop right here. Knocks over a cup of coffee. Knocks over a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, and then says you clean it up to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then maybe he orders like something that's totally not on the menu. I'm so sorry, Nick. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Like he's like, can I get a beer? Can Mm -hmm. I get a beer? And they're, and then just keep asking for it Mm -hmm. until they're like, what's wrong with this guy? See that, that. (laughs) <laughs> makes me uncomfortable to my core right because i think the other part of it is That's is the exercise yeah it's just the process now it's right. just different now it's getting comfortable with discomfort which i wouldn't have you knock over someone's yeah. stuff and tell right. them to clean it but we need to do little <laughs> teeny tiny <laughs> it's okay i mean go big or go home we need to do little teeny tiny they call it titration we need to basically teach your system how to tolerate the discomfort of not being on point and then after a while your brain will kind of get on board with the oh it's it's okay to have this, you know, it's more important to go than to go in the right direction. Like GPS, if you make a wrong turn, it'll reroute you. But your brain is like, no, neurologically, failure is going to kill you. So we have to give you little micro doses of discomfort Mm. and you can start that today. Well, I'm in one right now. (laughs) That's good. The cold plunge, just as you were saying that, I was like, the cold plunge is like, I do the cold plunge. Mm -hmm. And the reason I love it is is for that reason. Some people will say, obviously, there's a lot of physical benefits, which there are. But I just like the mental, the mental thing of of you preparing yourself to sit, which is not a net, like, that is not a fun experience. Nobody's like, I want to do that. But if you trick your brain enough, you can get to that point. And it's just like, it's just sitting in cold. 
Well, we and trick our okay brains all it. the time. We do. We just trick our brains unconsciously, and then our lives go off the rails, and we're stuck. Or we use this wonderful brain we have, trick it intentionally and consciously, and then life starts working again. Hmm. So yeah, I had a therapist give me the go fuck up three times thing, and it was awful. I only do it what twice. What did you do? Um, I dropped a giant plate of food in the middle of a very loud restaurant, like Whoa. crap, and Whoa. everyone stopped talking and froze and stared. And I was like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I didn't die. And then the other one was um, I walked into um, the wrong locker room. Oh, my God, I'm here. So sorry. And it was awful. Those are good. Terrible. Did you think of those on your own or were they prescribed? Yeah. yeah. And the third I couldn't do because I was so just frazzled by the two. So okay. I fucked up not doing the full three that I was assigned. This is interesting. When I think about like, so, so Moshe, who put us in touch um, on the negotiation thing, this is a part of his thing where he's like, go, when, when learning how to negotiate, go ask 10 people for things that you'd never ask them for. And during the class, you know, somebody asked his wife for a threesome, somebody was buying a car. And so they were like, can I get this for free? They ended up getting it for free. And so it was more of like a means to an end type negotiation, but making them really uncomfortable. Similar. Exact it's, same it's, thing. Yeah. Which is actually really cool. I like this part of the book where you mentioned shallow friends. Yes. And I think like, I think like my, so my wife owns her own company also. And I think one thing that she struggles with is this friend thing when we're both super busy individuals. And so the notion of having shallow friends and giving permission to do that is amazing. Can you just speak on that? Yeah. You know, we're not taught as adults that like the rules of childhood friendships, like I have a best friend and we tell each other everything and we're going to be best friends. till like those rules do not apply as adults. And we're not taught how to transition into a very adult, realistic way of looking at friendships. You don't need every friend to be a level 10. You know, it's like I have, I put in the book, I have a friend that I like to hike with and they're not really trustworthy and they're not really into depth, but they're really fun to climb things with so it's like why where do we learn that only things that are deep and meaningful and you know are on this end of the spectrum provide any value I could try to force my friend into a role that they're not going to fit in and then I'd be pissed off and it'd be high conflict but as long as you are like I think of it like casting a movie like are the people you're trying to cast are they available for that role and if not you need to find someone new that sucks but like you can have shallow friends I don't know where we learn that that's not appropriate and not okay. But childhood rules of friending do not apply as adults yeah. at all. And yes, social media friends count as friends. You know, we talk a lot about productivity on this show and I think there comes a time of day where it's really hard to stay productive. And and for me, it comes around like 2, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. I know a lot of people turn to coffee. I don't I don't like coffee. I, I never like the taste. But the other thing is like when I have a lot of caffeine, I tend to crash really hard. And Whatever gains I get from that in the meantime are are erased once I hit that crash. You know, this this product that we have today, Magic Mind, I've actually found that it doesn't give me that crash. It gives me the boost of energy I need without the crash. All of these energy booster drinks, I'm kind of skeptical on because like A, what's in it? And B, does it actually work? But here's the deal. Here's the truth. James Bashar, the founder of Magic Mind, came on the podcast in season three. He talked all about the what goes into the drinks. Great episode. The, and honestly, he was right. Like these magic minds do make a difference. Aside from matcha, it's got adaptogens, nootropics, and honey. And really like all of it natural, clean ingredients. It's just a great little energy boost that you can take. Some people take in the morning. I prefer it, you know, around lunchtime. And I find that it gets me through the rest of the day. You know, the, the, the one thing I will say is like you do have to shake it pretty well though and like that. Come on, doesn't that sound so good? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you, um, there it goes. Owen's oh, chugging it. Startup Storefront approved. We have a discount code for you. It's Storefront20, and that's for 20% off your order. But if you want to get the subscription, we have an even better deal for you, and it's 40% off, but it only lasts for 10 days after this episode airs, so you got to be quick about it. So You're saying 40% off? 40%? 40% like off. Almost, almost half, yeah. Wow. I can't believe it. Check it out. Storefront20, magicmind.co slash storefront. Wait, hold up. It so, stacks up so, 45%. So, so hold on. So hold on. It also stacks with the subscription discount from the website for a total of 45% off. I recommend it. This has been tried and tested many, many times over on the podcast. Storefront20, check it out. Up to 45% off in the first 10 days after this episode airs crazy discount 45 percent. check it out as you're going through like you know you're writing the book you're learning about yourself 
you're very educated in this game. Are you ever like, why do people get married? How on earth are we still functioning as a society <laughs> in any capacity? Because that's what I think about. Like the more I dig into all this, I'm like, we are so lucky because I think we're all either that or we're just all on the edge and COVID didn't help. Well, I think COVID exposed it more than okay. created it. You okay. know, COVID created this massive mental health crisis, and certainly there are lots of problems there. But more than anything, COVID exposed when we didn't have our nummy nums all available to us, that we're all alone with our thoughts. I'm amazed that people walk around not understanding that you have parts of your personality. It's not just one thing. It's like you have your shadow parts and your dark parts and your people pleaser parts. And it's like having a family of people inside you that you don't know are there. And so walking, and I didn't know this until I knew it. So walking around thinking it's just me in my head, holy shit, that sucks. Mm -hmm. So I wanna shake everyone and be like, it's not just you in there. It's all those voices and they're all friendly. Even the scary ones are friendly. So what's what's the, the the method with acknowledging them and embracing them? Is it like that they are situational or that that they exist in you at all times? When I think of like the the different aspects of, of my own life, you know, there are situations where I feel comfortable. There are situations where I feel uncomfortable, and how I react in those situations is very different than what I would view myself. And so, my self image is not all of those people all the time it's it's like i would say like the the dominant ones and is your philosophy that all of them are you or is it that you can be a different person in different situations that's such a good question and so first of all this is not my construct i use the internal family systems model dr richard schwartz and there's lots of versions of the multiplicity of the psyche theory like young ha there's tons so i think that like, it's kind of like your physical body like you don't need to be aware of it i couldn't even name every single body part like if you drew me in anatomy I would fail that test. So it's like, I don't need to be aware of every body part unless I use them often or unless something's going wrong. So with your personality, it's the same thing. You've got your main parts that you use. And if something is going wrong with one, you'll know, and that's the part to attend to. I don't believe that you are your parts. I believe that there's a self that's sort of like the collective conscious. We went way down this rabbit hole. The collective consciousness and your parts need to be essentially parented by the self. You know, some people call it the higher self, Christ consciousness, the divine, whatever you want to call it, the voice of reason inside your head. Did this journey for you make you spiritual in any way? Or assign spirituality to anything that you may have learned? Well, yourself? you know, the whole like science and spirituality as separate entities, I don't, yeah. I'm not on board with that. I'm like, spirituality is just really cool shit that we haven't figured out the science for yet or that we don't understand. So I don't differentiate the science. For, like to me, science is incredibly spiritual. Like, holy crap, there's a nerve in your head that when it goes off, you freeze and you don't do the things you want to do. Like, that's really cool. So yes, very spiritual, but not in the religious like sense. Yeah. Let's switch gears here for a second. So when you write the book, now you got to sell the book. Yeah. What are you doing? For anyone who's listening in ever, which is everyone, I think, trying to consider maybe writing a book one day, maybe about their life, maybe about something specific. But how did you go about either figuring out how to market it or, you know, your husband mentioned you had a really good story <laughs> around, around a publicist or a PR company? So I have lots of stories around publicity and PR, but really people who want to write books don't realize that you are not just a book writer, but you are also your own business of book selling. Cause you're, and I'm published by Penguin Random House and they're wonderful and they're huge, but if I want to sell books, I need to sell books. And so like anything, it's learning what goes into selling books, what goes into building a platform. If you're listening and you want to write a book, go build a platform. Because unless you want to self-publish, no one will publish you if you don't have an audience onto which to launch your product That's or right. your service. Right. Right. Was that clear to you from the jump? Well, from the beginning, I was like, I want to write a book. I don't know how to do it. So I went to conferences and I went to workshops and I read books and every single one of those hammered platform, platform, platform. You have to build a platform. Don't even worry about writing a sentence down. Put <laughs> okay. all of your efforts into building the platform. Get known. In, in the building of the platform, half the material from the book emerged because I got my message honed and I got my voice figured out. And as I was writing every day to build the platform, I'm like, oh, this is actually what I want to say. And I could test ideas. I'm like, I don't really like talking about that. I really like talking about that. And so I could sort of clarify my own message. And then by the time I had a platform, then it's okay, now I need to like put a book proposal together and get an agent and pitch and do all of that. Okay. How did you go about building a platform? What did you do? I used Instagram. I okay. mean, 
social media, pick your platform. I yeah. don't know all of them. I used that one and I just slugged it out. I researched and I spent hours and hours and hours every day. I wrote original content every day. I talked to people nice. who were doing it and asked them how they did it. You know, most people, unless they really suck, are happy to share. Mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> unless they're monsters. Yeah. We'll tell you how they did what they did. Yeah. Okay, so then you build your platform, you have this book, and then do you set a specific date in terms of selling it and then try to like do a bunch of awareness prior? Or like, obviously you had a PR firm at the beginning of this. Yeah, like how does the book publishing process work? Yeah. So you get your book deal and then your publisher says, turn it in on this date and then wait a year and a half for it to come out. Oh. So, oh yes. Wow. So during that year and a half, that's when you hone your marketing strategy and you talk to different publicists and figure out what works and what doesn't work and how you want, you know, what feels good to you. A lot of the things I was told to do don't feel really good to me. So I don't want to do TikTok and I don't want to be making videos on LinkedIn. Nothing wrong with it. I just didn't want to do it. So figure out what you're comfortable with. Cause if you hate, you know, you can be uncomfortable, but if you hate what you're doing every day, it's going to show in your work yeah. and people aren't going to want it. Why not TikTok? I'm just curious. It's <laughs> of like dating myself here. It's so overwhelming to me. I spent all my time learning Instagram. And now that I have a handle on how Instagram works, TikTok is like, I don't know how it works. I yeah. don't get it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. I'll just say this much too, just from a data perspective, it's mostly Gen Z. And so I don't know if that's your audience. I, I really have no idea. But um, Instagram is certainly more millennial. And so it seems more fitting. I'm like, I I, I'm not an elder millennial. I'm like a geriatric millennial. <laughs> <laughs> and then why not LinkedIn? I don't Again, like just it. Curious. I don't. I just don't like it. Yeah. There's no rhyme or reason. And my husband, who's very business oriented, is like, you know, you could do this and this, and he's right. But I have found if I am actually enjoying what I'm doing and how I'm doing it, mm -hmm. I haven't had a problem coming up with a book idea, selling it, and getting it published using one platform. Mm -hmm. So yay. What are your goals for this book? You know, my biggest thing was I thought I was crazy for so long. And I have a private practice where people come in every day. And the number one thing they say from across every demographic is, am I crazy? Is this normal? And it's like, yes, it's normal. No, you're not crazy. And so the world, I mean, it's not altruistic. The world is more fun to be in when people aren't walking around feeling bad about themselves. Because people who feel bad about themselves are generally either hiding and you can't get to them or they're assholes and they're hurting people. People. So, you know, if you know you're not crazy and you know how to not be stuck, like my life's going to be better. Your life's going to be better. My business is going to be better. We're all going to make more money and be happier. Totally. So this is why we need to get Nick unstuck. Well, Come on, Nick. What's it, next? Well, is it as simple as just validating them that they're not crazy? Like when I hear that everyone comes into your office and asks, are they crazy? Even if you were to say, no, this is, this is the human condition. This is normal. I feel like at some level, like some people might be looking for just that validation, but there's, there's more to it than that. And how would you like break that down from, okay, why do you think this is crazy? Like I'm, I'm just psychoanalyzing this on my own here with no background whatsoever in, in that. But yeah, when I think of, am I crazy for doing this? We all ask our friends, we ask our, our family that question, but there's, there's that level of, even if they say, no, you're not crazy, you're still going to have that moment of self-doubt. So, how, of how, them. so like, and this comes back to like the, the getting unstuck. Like, is it, is it as simple as hearing, no, you're not crazy? Or is it, there are a lot more steps to it? No, it is absolutely not that simple. If only like people yeah. come into me, see me for one session. It's like, no, you're not crazy. You make sense. Crazy. Okay. Off you go. Bye. Have fun. Yeah. So no, that's the starting place. And really we have to rule out, you know, privilege access to resources. Assuming someone is in a, my people that I work with generally are in a safe enough environment with multiple choices and access to resources. If you don't have those things, then we don't even need to talk about the why is your psyche constructed and what is consciousness it's like we need to get you food and a safe place to live however assuming that you are in a safe enough environment the question of validation is number one number two and this is for you nick i would say your assignment is never again for the next six months ask a why question because why is going to create more analysis paralysis why is my favorite question. i know and how's that working for you <laughs> It's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. So change your whys to what's. Instead of why am I thinking this, it's what are five choices available to me right now? And of those five, what can I say yes to? And if of those five you can't move, then make them smaller and keep going and keep breaking them down until you can get one yes. Like a micro step forward is preferable to spinning. So change your why to what. 
then five choices, pick one and go. And then orient, look around, am I still okay? Is everyone okay? Like everyone's okay, no one's dead, cool. Okay, do it again, five more choices. Go. You're going to hate this so much. No more wise. Just, just the fact that I can't ask why anymore. No more yeah. wise. Everyone I, in this room. I realize how much I've de been de so dependent good. on why. Lexi's so, look at this banana. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Don't let Nick ask why questions anymore. Like I have a bell in my office that I will ding people when they start doing that. Oh, we should have a bell. Oh. I mean, that'll change your life. Because again, you've hung on to this why, but really you can answer all the whys in the world and why doesn't create momentum. You're still going to stay in that state of inertia, even with all the under, I mean, why can be useful, but why is only helpful after you're in motion? Why will not get you from stuck to go? What are my choices will get you from stuck to go? And then your nervous system and all these other factors that need to be addressed sort of get funneled into that assignment. When you're asking, what are my choices? Your brain likes that. The parts of your brain that are on fire that don't let you move will go, oh, we have choices. Okay, what, what if, none of those, I don't like any of those. Okay, we'll make them smaller, make them smaller, keep breaking them down. Once you get going, you're going to build compound momentum very quickly. Yeah. I, I can already like, he sounds like he feels better. Yeah. No, <laughs> no like that's actionable. Like I'm already yeah. breaking down scenarios in my mind of like, okay, so just why to nah. what? Nah. And I'm going to, I'm going to try that. Right. And now what, well, what might happen if this happened? Like, no, no, no. Cause that's a why hiding. What should be followed by actionable steps? Right. And again, I'm, I'm like, I love to analyze. I love to dig in the abyss of the psyche, but most people just want to do their things and live their life and go. So change why to what it'll change your life. Okay. I'll, I'll check back in with you in six months and let you know how <laughs> it's going. Do you have any advice for people who, or do you have, do you have any belief in, in manifesting? <laughs> yes. I get into so much trouble when I veer into that arena. I can't even talk. So manifesting assumes that every single thing in your life you have because your thoughts created it. So Co correct. the thoughts create the reality. So if you have a million dollars, you created it. If you're sexually assaulted, you created it. If something oh. happens and someone you love dies, you created it. I do not subscribe to that. To any form of it, positive or negative. To any form, well, you know, there's I guess a, you don't give it credence because if you do, then you have to accept all of it. There's a degree to which, yeah, the thoughts you think are going to influence your choices and that's going to influence your environment, which is going to create things that are either helpful or not helpful. But the victim blamey, like, you know, if everything wrong with you is because you're not thinking good enough thoughts, totally bypasses the reality of your brain and your body. Like if your central nervous system is stuck on off, you're gonna manifest depression, but that's not your fault, that's your brain. And so I don't like any, there's always nuggets of truth in almost any body of belief, but I don't like this all encompassing, think it and have it, think it and be it. It's like, yeah, well, what about free will? And what about geopolitical unrest? And what about, a like who manifested COVID? Like whose fault is that? Who can we blame, right? And this question of who's to blame, is a really useful way to bypass our own crap. Because, well, if you manifested it, that's on you and your other. And I'm not like that. It's like, well, technically, we all have like a full set of personality characteristics from yay, light and shiny and love and light to wow, I want to. I mean, there's a reason that true crime is popular. Why? I can't understand. <laughs> I, I don't need My wife loves it. They all love, most people do. Why do you think they love it? I, I, a part of me thinks like that in their head, Everyone's watched a horror movie, so there's a fear of them being murdered. And this is like the closest they'll ever get to understanding like, oh, if I'm ever in this position with this it? guy, I'll know why he's going to kill me and I'll run away. Like a part of me is like, they're just surviving through this narrative. But I'm also like, why do we need to do that? I don't think it's anything that's made up. Yeah. I did. Uh, I did a post on this a while back. There are lots of reasons people love true crime, but there it's also are... entertaining. Some of it's just entertaining. Oh. The whole voyeuristic thing is one of the shadow qualities of that people don't want to admit. Like clutches at pearls. How could you say that I revel in the misfortunes of others? I'm like, look at what you're looking at on like the internet. The, the like evidence. The is evidence there. is there. So there's a part of the human condition that likes watching people suffer. Another one is fear that this could happen to me. So yeah. it's that hypervigilance. Yeah. The but training. The, the training. But the third is if you have any kind of unresolved trauma and you don't understand why and you don't understand, there's the why, and you don't understand, well, everything looks fine. I don't know what's wrong with me. Watching things like true crime are going to put it, like it's very easy to see. She's being murdered. Murder is bad. When it's your life that's complicated and chaotic, looking at something as black and white as murder is bad is very comforting because mm. it's clear. That was that's a, so interesting. Yeah. yeah. So you're like, I had such a bad day. 
but at least I'm not getting murdered. Yeah, right. <laughs> like this poor soul on television. Like at least I'm yeah. better off than them. I'm going to tell my wife you said that, and I can't wait for her to have a different reaction. I'll be like, you need to deal with your trauma. <laughs> I, well, I had someone DM me a very long rant. It's like, no, I Brit, I work in the criminal justice system, and I watch oh. true crime as a way of getting data and have, helping me. I'm like, okay, yes, this post is not for you. Please right. scroll on by. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. humans are complex. She's working. Yeah. But generally, voyeurism pain avoidance, our own trauma avoidance, or seeking comfort in someone else's misfortune tend to be the big themes that I see. That's so fascinating. I used to be obsessed with it. I stopped after I started doing, I mean, for me personally, not for everyone, for me personally, it was, I don't understand what's happening to me because all of my abuse and trauma was so confusing. That is comforting because it makes sense. Like that yeah. makes sense to me. Yeah. And so I lost myself in it. And when I did my sexual trauma work, I just stopped watching it. Not that that's true for everyone. That was my truth. At a high level, when you think about sort of like your journey, maybe my journey, Nick's, Nick embarking on his journey, how do we democratize the ability for people to start sort of leaning in and really doing the work on themselves without having to like, like how do we do that at scale as a society? That's a question. Because that's, a... that's, that's the thing. It's like when I think about people's journey, it's usually they have to have resources. Mm -hmm. If you need to see a therapist, that, that's not free. Right. Not many people have that ability. Right. Right. And so I just think about socioeconomically, how do we get to a point where, so like I'm on this board of Imagine LA, there are resources available for them. But then there's this gap, mm -hmm. the low class, let's call it, that may have funds to survive and eat, but they don't have access. Right. And so how do, how do we solve that? And maybe YouTube, I don't know. I'm just... I don't have an answer to like, how do we solve just like the social inequality problem? But I can say... If you're, you know, everyone has their work in the world to do, and our brains are not designed to be able to tend to every problem of every population on every country. Like, it's just not physiologically possible to be of use to people, all of the people in all of the areas. And then we get stuck in, well, I, I, there's so much going on, and now my nervous system is frozen, and now I've been reading the news for six hours, which doesn't help anybody. So ask yourself, what's your work in the world to do? If you know, you know what your lane is, and you're good at it, then like that will be of service to people and if we all did our stuff that would sort of work itself out in the end can you turn it off me you personally in like what, your like, ability to like analyze and 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 just kind of go oh i see this person that might have trauma but i'm gonna i'm not gonna ask like can you personally turn because i don't think i'd be able to i, I think i would just because you you are keen you, you can identify it from a mile away i would imagine and so the thing is like yeah can you turn it off do you so, okay, so with my clients, obviously, no, that's right. my work and that's what that's I do. World, yeah. But mm -hmm. people like to tell me their, st like, okay. even when I don't, if I tell someone I'm a therapist, like my Uber driver is going into some, I'm like, I'm not your therapist, I'm a <laughs> therapist. But you don't um, have the time. <laughs> exactly. I, I don't turn off the seeing. It's sort of like this weird, like, if you have trauma, you can sort of spot it. But I don't, I have really good boundaries around my work. And even my good friends know, like, Go to your therapist. Like, don't trauma. Trauma dumping is not kind. And another myth of adult friends is that we're supposed to hold space and trauma dump all over each other. Yeah. And that's not helpful. I mean, venting and, you know, being cathartic can be useful. But generally, us vomiting our stuff all over each other, not helpful. So I don't turn off the seeing, but I very much turn off the engaging. So Got sometimes it. I just tell people I'm an accountant. That shuts them up. <laughs> <laughs> no follow-up questions. Not a I have a huge tax bill. <laughs> yeah. How much of, of this is, is cultural? I, I look at cultures around the world, and I know the U.S. has a, has a big problem with, with uh, machismo and, and just kind of like, especially with, with men, like bottling things up until it's way too late and then they explode. What can we do as a, as a society, as a, a culture? Like if you were to, I don't know, be the, the um, you know, elected into like a cabinet position of therapy or, or whatever it might be, <laughs> What would you be your first steps into changing the, the culture in the U.S. to address as a whole this issue? So there's this really interesting story about how there was um, a tsunami and the U.S. sent like this team of like top notch traumatologists and therapists over to help the people because surely they would be traumatized and all have raging PTSD because that's a really big disaster. 
none of them suffered from the symptoms and all of these like i am american and i'm here to help people were confounded like we you don't need and the reason that those people did not suffer from ptsd is because trauma is not defined by the events it's defined by how are we held in the aftermath are we supported are we in a culture that values cooperation and collaboration and connection and compassion and all the c words that are good we do not here and so in that particular place where the trauma therapists were sent they got each each other. They had each other's children. They had each other's backs. They were bringing each other food. And as a community, they didn't suffer from massive PTSD. We do. Because when was the last time you had a group of people who you could really connect with in a healthy, skillful way where you could be real? That's so fascinating. In yeah. Peru, in Peru when, you have, when you have a child, um, it's like your family takes over. And then there's a lot of emphasis on the, the husband and wife like resuming date nights. And so there's like a village, a tribe to yeah. some extent where they're just like, we have the baby and it's all the aunts and uncles and they make sure like your job is to get out of the house and go have date nights. Yes. And it's I, a really interesting thing. And like neurologically With no sounds, judgment. Just like totally like this is what we do. It's normalized. It's normalized. This is just how we do. I yeah. had a play therapy practice and when I closed it, but when parents would come to me like, what's the best thing I could do to help my kid? I'm like... Go on date nights with your partner. <laughs> yeah, leave. Like, leave. Get a break. Par- I don't have children, and there's a reason. Parenting is freaking hard. It's hard. So yeah. tend to the hard because it's better for your kid and the mom guilt of, I, I feel guilty leaving my child. I'm like, it's better for your child for you to have a girl's night. I promise. Yeah. I think there's a there's a lack of a holistic view on, on how one person's sort of desire to help me. It's like the detachment attachment thing we were talking about before. Yes. Their attachment to their baby means they're de- de- detached from their own happiness of their yes. own, whether they want to play tennis or just do yoga. Anything. They miss it. Yeah. Tell people where they can find the book, buy the book, listen to the book, which is what I did. <laughs> All the things. We covered so much ground. So you can find me on Instagram. I have a TikTok, but I'm never on it. So on Instagram, you can find me at Britt Frank and the book is scienceofstuck.com and buy it wherever books are sold. I have a hot take I want to end on because I find this so interesting. So so earlier or yesterday I was watching this thing and it's like, um, it's a YouTube clip and it's, it's this interesting th- worldview where as soon as dating apps came online, so you had a hundred men, a hundred women, let's call it. And all of a sudden, like 10 men are getting all the attention. And so that means like 90. And they really say this in a weird way, but you have 90 guys that all of a sudden have zero chance, right? And all the women hold the control. And so the control dynamic has shifted. Of these 90 men, they're becoming very like isolated and angry. And angry. What's going on? Do you, any, do you believe this is happening? Is it happening? What do we do about it? I saw that article too, that like, why aren't men having sex? Like men in their twenties are having less sex. Well, part of that is because they're watching more porn and that's not a total judgment on porn. It's just like, that is a fact. There's more porn available. The more porn people watch, the less they feel the need to go out sometimes in some cases. And yeah, I've read too that the algorithm favors, you know, the top 10% of a group of men. So it's like, Going back to Nick's assignment was, if you're coming to me and I have plenty of men come to me and they're pissed off and women suck and I never get blocked, it's like, okay, what are five choices available to you? If you're not getting what you want on the apps, go look somewhere else. Like, go do something that makes you happy. I promise you, happy people are magnetic if we want to talk what manifestation. You, what do you tell them? Like, like happy, is it the gym? Is it a Find hobby? Find something is that makes it... you, that you like. It's super simple. It's like, okay. do you want to go to the gym? Do you want to play tennis? Do you want to like find people, like-minded people to do shit with? And nothing is more attractive to a woman than mm. a man who is doing stuff. And I tell all the women I work with. Who's not asking why all the time. Exactly. <laughs> Big red flag. If the guy you're interested in why doesn't you have say that? it. Oh boy, I'm, I'm getting out of that one. You mean what would I say? Yeah. <laughs> Take that and run with it. Yeah. Yeah. Do stuff. Be happy. It's not like, I promise you, there are plenty of women on the freaking planet. You will not be without a woman. Go be happy. Do stuff. You made me feel better because I read that. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. we're going to war. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, if these guys don't get a hobby, they're going to get guns and we're all yeah. going to war. Yeah. It's going to be a problem. Britt, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you for so your much. expertise. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think you solved Nick's problem. I'm changing my wise to what's. Yes. This is going to be amazing. Go, Nick. Thank you so much. If you made it this far, I bet you loved the episode. So you should join our YouTube channel membership for only $2.99 a month. This gets you access to one, the whole unabridged conversation. Two, you get the episodes on Monday, one day earlier. Three, you get two additional entries to our giveaways. Check out our Instagram to see what we've given away. And four, you get access to seasons one through three. That's over a hundred episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice. What are you waiting for? Join.